once again to the midweek service, Bible study, Tabernacle Baptist Church of Roanoke, Texas. We're so glad at whatever opportunity you have to join with us that you are. We thank God for each and every one that takes and participates of this particular ministry. And we trust and pray that God is blessing you. We pray that if you are unsaved, that you'll come to the saving knowledge of Christ. And as a believer, you'll be encouraged. And we do thank the Lord. Once again, if you are able, we would count it a special blessing to join with us every Wednesday night by this ministry. If you have your Bibles tonight, we'd like you to turn to 2 Peter 3.18. And Peter makes a statement that's very, very important. You know, in sometimes familiarity with the scripture, we just pass over it. But I think some of the most important information to the believer is found in this one particular verse as in other places but this is very very unique and I want us to look at it a little bit closer than we might ordinary look at Peter says but grow in grace now what does it mean growing in the knowledge of Jesus Christ Look at it. He said, But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To Him be glory both now and ever. Amen. What does it mean to grow in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? How can we be sure that we are growing in this knowledge? Peter has defined what it meant to grow in the knowledge of Christ and his definition is found in 2 Peter 1, 2 through 11 and we want to look at that tonight for our lesson. We find that there are a list of graces and I think they should be reviewed as the bricks that are built upon a solid foundation of knowledge of Christ. Well, why should we desire to grow in this knowledge? I mean, I'm saved. I've been forgiven. I'm going to heaven. I know Christ loves me. I know he takes care of me. What is it or why is it that I need what Peter said, this knowledge of Jesus Christ. So, what growing in the knowledge of Jesus Christ involves? It involves the development of eight graces or areas in our life. You know, one of the tragedies and one of the failures. I think has taken place among the believer is many of them think I'm saved that's it no sir no ma'am that's simply the beginning of the life that God desires that conforms us to the image of his son Jesus Christ that brings us into that relationship that illuminates and shows forth Jesus. So I want you to look at these areas as listed here. Number one, you find faith. And what faith is? It's conviction and strong assurance. Then it says, number two, virtue. And that is moral excellence and goodness. Then number three, it says knowledge. That's correct insight. Number four, temperance is self-discipline. Number five, patience. 
is bearing up and remaining steadfast under trials. Then godliness is godly character out of the devotion to God. Number seven, brotherly kindness is love toward the brethren. And finally, number eight, charity is active goodwill toward those in need. Now, what is the benefit if we, if we understand these graces and we build upon these graces in our Christian life? Look at 2 Peter 1.8. We often hear as, as a pastor and a counselor, it just seems my Christian life is, is always a failure. It don't seem like I'm growing. It don't seem like I'm going. It doesn't seem like, I mean, just up and down, up and down. No consistency. But Peter learned from that same position after the Lord had give him this and he said through these eight and by the way number eight is the number of resurrection or new beginning and when you get saved you're a new creature and you've got a brand new beginning and God desires that in that new beginning you mature into that image of his only begotten son that you become like Christ look at it and if you possess them what is the importance of having these graces what's the importance of, of building on these graces what's the importance as a believer now we're not saved by works we're saved by grace but because we're saved the Bible says work out your own salvation not far but out with fear and trembling. Well, Peter gives us how that we work out. You see, the part we have is allowing God to teach us, and he tells us very plainly through Peter how that these eight graces are what we build upon, what we build at the strength of the Christian life, not by works of righteousness, which we do, but by the building bricks of what we're going to look at tonight. The knowledge of Christ. The knowledge of Christ. Look at it. But what's the benefit? Look at 2 Peter 1.8. For if these things be in you and abound, not if you just know them, but if you accept them and you constantly build upon them. Not a one-day opportunity, but a life commitment. If you live upon these bricks as a Christian, then he said very plainly in 2 Peter 1.8, For these things be in you and abound. They make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the benefit. That's the benefit. We get to know who Christ is. We get to know what Christ desires. We need to know how to imitate and become the image of Christ and glorify the Father and lift up the Son. Look at it. Nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. We must abound. That means the increase of these eight areas. Only then can it be said that we're growing in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Now, <coughs> I want to give you an important piece of information. Look at those eight graces there. Look at them in your Bible if you got your Bible. If not, we listen to the program. They're in sequential order. You cannot move one from the positions it's in. You must go one. One should, then two should build up off of one. Four should build up off of three. Five should build up off of six. Six should build up off of seven. And seven should co be completed in verse eight or in eight, the eighth grace. Here's the problem. 
some Christians think, well, let me see. Um, well, I'll, I'll pick this with brotherly kindness. It doesn't work that way. They are sequential. They go in order. They cannot be substituted. And each one, after we start the first one, faith, because without faith it's impossible to please God. Then that moral excellency or virgins, virgins, uh, virtuousness should build up off of that faith. God said it's sin, I accept it as sin. God said only through his power can I live for Christ. We exercise that faith. That's what causes that life change. And then knowledge. The more that we put those first two into practice, the more we learn the value of it, the victory in it, the power in it, and the pleasure that we bring to God. And then you go on. And each one must build upon the other. But I've run down and I'm sure, look at me, we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now I'm no different just because I'm a preacher. But I'm sure, in fact I'll confess, there have been times I thought I could maybe shuffle those. Maybe, you know, just move one down a little bit, you know. And the Holy Spirit says, no, no, no. You go sequential or none of them are working in your life. So you can't improve upon God's plan. You can't improve upon God's word. You don't have a better ideal than God does. And for your reason, I mean for his reason and our benefit, he has put these in sequential order that we might come to the fullness of our knowledge in Christ. That we might be able then to imitate Christ. We might become his image. We might go forth bringing glory to the Father and lifting up the Son. Look at it. Look at it. Only then can it be said that we're growing in the knowledge. And Peter is talking about growing in a fuller and more personal knowledge of Jesus Christ. Now, a lot of people have corporate knowledge of Christ. Oh, we know he went to the cross. We know he shed his blood. We know he became sin. We know he was buried. We know that he arose from the grave on the third day. We know he loves the church. We know he wants us to practice stewardship. But listen to me. Listen to me. Remember what he said in John 15, except we abide in him. We can do nothing. Here's the sadness. We know... We, we know the outreach of Christ, but how many of his children, how many of those that he saved know him personally? Know him personally. Do you know how Jesus feels? Do you know what saddens him? Do you know what brings him joy? Do you know the desire that he has that the Bible said he came to give you life and give it to you more abundantly? Do you know how it disappoints and brings sadness to him? I believe with all my heart when we willfully, premeditatedly choose not to follow him or obey him. How many really, really, you know if you look in the Bible and the people like David and the people like Paul and the people like Stephen, you know what was the difference in them and the average Christian? Listen to me. They knew Jesus personally. They spent time with the Lord to know who he was. Now everybody that's saved knows he's the Savior. Sometimes we even have in our physical family. Oh, we're all blood kin and everything, but families go through it and never really know each other. That's the sadness today among God's people. And Jesus has done everything. And the Father tells us that we have all things through Christ, which strengthens us. And how many people, oh, I'm not saying you're not born again. I'm not saying you haven't truly repented and been saved and are going to be with him in heaven. But let me be honest. If we were to really sit down, how much personally do you know about Jesus? Huh? When's the last time you 
got back to studying the life of Christ. Do you know that Jesus, listen to me, opened his heart. We don't pay no attention to it. And he's in the Bible, opened his heart to us. And sometimes we just walk on it because we won't take enough time to spend with him. Say, Lord, what do you think? Lord, what do you want? I haven't asked you in a long time, what could I do to, to bring you joy? What could I do to, to appreciate the love that you've given me and do give me? Oh, like I said, we, we've got down all the doctrinal and, and technical uh, knowledge of the Bible. We know he's the only way to heaven. We know if we don't come to Calvary, we can't go. But did you ever take time to see why he went to Calvary? The pain and agony that he went through because he loved us with an immutable love. He had the love of the Father, immutable. That means it could never change no matter how bad we've treated him, no matter how we've abused him. His love has not changed. Oh, look at it. That's what Peter's talking about in this text. When Peter weren't there, it forever revolutionized him. You see, when he denied the Lord, and the Lord just went by and looked at him, for the first time, he really saw Jesus in a personal relationship. I, I really heard him. And it so changed him. For the first time, I think Peter in his life really understood. I hurt Jesus. I hurt him bad. After all he'd done for me. I hurt him. And I wonder if you ever stopped or if you stopped lately or ever stopped and really thought. Wait a minute. True, he is God. True, he is God. But listen, he's also man. And have you ever stopped just to think about, wait a minute, I never really give it no consideration how that might be hurting Jesus. We sometimes think he's, he's without emotion, he's without feeling. What do you think you've got yours? He's not some distant God somewhere that's cold-hearted and doesn't care. Look at it. You see, the more we grow and in these areas, the more we really know Jesus. So I'm not asking you, do you know him as personal Savior? I'm asking you, do you know him as the Savior? There's a difference. Considering the meaning of the word knowledge, the word means to become thoroughly acquainted with, to know thoroughly, to know accurately, to know well. If I was given an examination on just that definition, I imagine there would have to be some, I'm sorry, Lord. I've been so busy about your business, I forgot the reason for your business. And that's you. That's you. Such knowledge comes only as we demonstrate these Christ-like graces in our life. And what does that mean? It, we, we, these graces are to come from experience. It's not that I can quote it. It's not that I can name them. It's that I'm experiencing them. Knowledge comes from the experience of using these graces. Second, it involves developing these graces as listed in order. Notice the word in 2 Peter 1.5, the little word add. Before each grace, 
mention the word is implied. So this is what I've been trying to get you to see. One is where you start. And it's supposed to add two to it. And then two is to add three. Three is to add four. Four is to add five. Five is to add six. Six is to add seven. And seven is to add eight. And then we have that promise that Peter said we received from the Lord in 2 Peter 1.8 that we repeat again. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. I get to thank you even now. How we know him in that family knowledge but how truly you see what made Paul and, and, and David the men they were they knew Jesus personally Paul did Paul knew Jesus personally because he took time to spend time with him and he paid attention to what the Lord was doing and what he was saying and he said, I count everything as done that I might win Christ. And he said, for me to depart is far better to be absent from the body to be present with the Lord was his desire. Why? Because he had such an intimate relationship with Jesus. He was lonely. He wanted to go and be with Jesus. It wasn't heaven Paul was looking for. It was Jesus. And I think sometimes we fail when we put the emphasis on going to heaven, that's not the emphasis. One day we're going to get to be with Jesus. Heaven just simply is simply the place, but that's not the important part. To be with Jesus, no matter where we were, would be complete. Think about that. Think about that. Notice it. The word add comes from a root that means to furnish, Besides, fully supply or contribute. So each one of those, like I've said, after you start with number one, then that's the new birth, faith. Then you're supposed to add these others until you've completed all eight. And then once you have all eight, you're to go that same way and strengthen them. Your faith is to grow. Your virtue is to grow. Your knowledge is to grow. Your temperance is to grow. Your patience is to grow. Godliness is to grow. Brotherly kindness and charity is to grow. Grow. That which is not used is nothing but waste. Think about it. Think about it. Think about it very carefully. We develop one quality as we exercise another quality. These graces relate to each other the way the branches relates to the trunk and the twigs of the branch. The father and the child must work together. The word then suggests the idea of each grace working in harmony with the others to produce an overall effect. I can't have, I can't have that promise that we see there in 2 Peter 1 8 if I haven't built on all of these graces. All of them. All of them. Think about it. Think about it. Now notice the preposition. To. Look at that little word to. This suggests that each grace is to temper. And make perfect the grace that goes before it. Consider this illustration. To knowledge add temperance. Self control. Enable one to apply properly the knowledge one has. To temperance add patience. Self control in turn needs to quality of patience. To be consistent day after day. So we see that each grace is necessary. They must all be developed in conjunction with each other. We cannot be selective and just pick the ones we like and leave others behind. Notice the words diligent in verse 5 and 10. It means earnestness and zeal. To grow in the knowledge of Jesus Christ requires much effort. Why should we be growing in the knowledge of Jesus Christ? 
You see, they do not develop accidentally or naturally. They require experience. But why should we? Grace and peace are multiplied in this knowledge. 2 Peter 1, 2. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Grace the greeting which requests God's unmerited favor upon the person addressed. Peace, the greeting requesting the natural result of God's favor. These two blessings are multiplied in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. All things pertain to life and godliness are given through verses 3 and 4. Only as we grow in this knowledge do we enjoy that truth, full life available by God's divine power, which includes exceedingly great and precious promises which enable us to be partakers of divine nature, which can free us from the corruption that is in the world through lust. Failure to grow in this knowledge results in spiritual myopathy or amnesia. Second Peter 1, 9, But he that lacks these things is blind, cannot see afar off, has forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Our vision is short-sighted if we're not growing in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. For what is the ultimate objective of being a Christian? To become like Christ. Romans 8, 29, For whom he did foreknow, also he did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. As we've seen, this is what really means to grow in the knowledge of Christ. Failure to so grow is an indication that we forgot why we were redeemed by the blood of Christ in the first place. To have our sins forgiven, yes, but then that we might present ourselves to God and become like he wants us to be, like his son. Now let's close. Second Peter 1 10. Wherefore, rather, brethren, given diligence to make your call and election sure, for if you do these things, you shall never fall. This does not mean we'll never sin. He says if we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth's not in us. The word fall here means to fall into misery, become wretched, lose the joy of God's salvation. We will never fall so far as to lose our salvation. But by possessing these eight graces and growing, we'll be able to live victorious in this life and joyfully anticipate what ahead. Because Paul did. Here's what we ought to be looking for, and I'm through. 2 Timothy 4, 6-8. I am now ready to be offered a time of my departures at hand. I fought a good fight, I finished my course, I've kept the faith, henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which is the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but to all them that love his appearing. So let me ask you, are we growing in knowledge? Are we spiritually brain dead? We need to wake up today, ladies and gentlemen, because time is short. Father, bless the message in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.